Good evening, everyone. Hello and welcome. This evening, Anna Malika Tubbs shares her new book, The Three Mothers, with us. She'll be in conversation with Lamurchi Frazier from the Museum of African American History. I'm Kristen Motti, an adult programs librarian at the Boston Public Library. The BPL is honored to be offering this program in partnership with the Museum of African American History, the New England Historic Genealogical Society American Ancestors, the State Library of Massachusetts, all neighbors here in Boston. Before Anna and Lamurchi join us, just a few quick points of housekeeping. We're in Zoom webinar and also streaming over YouTube, so cameras and microphones are turned off. This program is being recorded and you'll be, it will be available on the BPL's YouTube channel. We've implemented closed captioning in Zoom, so if you'd like to turn it off, just click the live transcript button and you can turn it off in there. Questions for Anna Malaika Tubbs will be taken throughout the entire program. You can go ahead and type in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And if you're, if you're watching on YouTube, you can go ahead and type in the chat and we'll get to as many of them as time allows toward the end of our hour together. Now to tell us how to buy a copy of The Three Mothers from our local bookstore partner for this talk, Frugal Bookstore. Here is Beth Carol Horrocks from the State Library of Massachusetts. Welcome, Beth. Thank you, Kristen, and hello, everyone. I am Beth Carol Horrocks, the head of special collections at the State Library of Massachusetts. We are going to keep our introductory remarks uh, short tonight, but I'd like to tell you that we're delighted to be here for this virtual discussion for two main reasons. One, because of the work itself, of course, and also because this virtual format has allowed us to expand our audience so much and to increase um, our collaborations with local partners. So you'll see next on the screen, uh, a slide that tells you how to buy the book. Signed copies of the book are going to be available from the Frugal Bookstore, which is a community bookstore located here in the Boston area in Roxbury. The link is here and we will have it in the chat box and then the slide will be up again at the end of the presentation. So the State Library is currently working remotely. We're providing excellent service to our patrons and I'll tell you more about our programs and our collections at the end of the program. And now to Margaret. Thanks, Beth, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Margaret Talkett. I'm the producer of literary programs at American Ancestors New England Historic Genealogical Society, and I am delighted to be with you in the land of history of America and its families of women, Black American women, and particularly mothers. Tonight, we're focused on three women whose impact on our culture has not been recognized, nearly erased. Tonight, with this book, this event, we're giving new life and voice to these very important mothers. And speaking about important people, it is my honor to uh, introduce our moderator this evening, who is really the gold standard for vision and action around Boston and beyond. Lamurchi Frazier is Director of Education and Interpretation for the Museum of African American History here in the city and in Nantucket. For 15 years, she's been highlighting the museum's collections and exhibitions, providing place-based education and interdisciplinary history programs, projects, and lectures. As if that's not enough, Lamurchi Frazier is a local and an internationally acclaimed visual and performance artist and poet and a member of Women of Color Quilters Network. She's been recognized by the City of Boston's Office of Art and Culture Residency Program, serving the Department of Substance Abuse Recovery Services. She's been awarded artistic residency programs in Brazil, Taiwan, Africa, Cuba, and closer to home at the New England Foundation for the Arts, Northeastern University and its law school, and at MIT Fab Labs. Uh, Lamurchi's fiber works have been included in several art publications and in the permanent collections of the Museum of Arts and Design in New York City, the Minneapolis Institute of Art, the Smithsonian Institute, and the White House. Yes, that White House. Boston nobility you are. Uh, thank you so much, Lamurchi, for moderating this evening. Anna, at the start of her book, um, 
says that one of her impetuses for writing it was that she really wanted to sit down and talk to these three brilliant women and get them to answer questions. And now lucky you, Lamurchi, you get to do the same with Anna, talking to her about them, these brilliantly educated, amazingly impactful women. So welcome Lamurchi and onward we go. Well, I wanna thank you, Margaret. I'm humbled by your comments and I am so delighted and thrilled to bring this precious treasure as an author to our audiences tonight. The Museum of African-American History is very proud uh, to display her work in ways that is accessible for our audiences to get into work with this collaboration. So, uh, Anna, uh, you are very welcome tonight, but I do want to just make a couple of comments about you so the <laughs> audience will know who they're dealing with. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, I, I do want to take a shout out to Alberta, Bertis, and Louise because we get through you to meet them tonight in ways that we may not have had accessible. And I'm just going to say a plug here. We want you to buy this book. It is available for you, hot, 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 off the press, published in February this year. So um, I do want to say some words about Anna. Anna Malika Tubbs is a PhD candidate in sociology at Cambridge University, where she also earned an MA in multidisciplinary gender studies. Her undergraduate degree in anthropology is from Stanford University. She's a passionate writer and speaker on issues of gender and race. Anna is an educator and a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant. She has written for Harriet, Darling Magazine, Huffington Post, and Blaverty all carry her articles. And as the first partner, of the mayor of Stockton, California. She also co-authored the first report on the status of women in Stockton. Anna's other accolades come from her being an author, an advocate, a black feminist writer. She has uh, been raised and grew up in abroad in Dubai, Mexico, Sweden, Estonia, She's influenced by her exposure to all kinds of cultures and beliefs. She's inspired to bring people together through the celebration of difference, motivated by her mother's work, advancing for women and children's rights around the world. Anna uses an intersectional lens in her work to advocate for women of color and educate others. It is my distinct privilege to bring to you a mother, wife, friend, scholar, change maker, Anna Malika Tubbs. Thank you so, so Anna, much, Marichi. Thank you for that introduction. I'm so honored to be here with you tonight and it's really just a pleasure. I'm excited for our conversation. I am too. And I would like to start with how intriguing your book is. Uh, I almost couldn't put it down. I started and I had some other things to do before I could get into the real heart of it. And so what really struck me was the way that you introduced your chapters. And one of the exceedingly uh, wonderful intros to this book is in your introduction. And I would like to read, if I may. I yes, thank you. Our mothers were the ashes and we were the light. Our mothers were the embers and we were the sparks. Our mothers were the flames and we were the blaze by Edridge Danticant. And then following that, it says, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Mama, I love you. Tell the kids I love them. I'm dead, George Floyd. This gave me immediately an intro to how wide ranging your text is. And can you share here this volume uh, as you wrote it, what it meant to you to make this kind of a wide arcing breadth 
of history through the lives of these women. Yeah, each quote that I use to start each chapter even stops me, even though I'm the one who chose them. It gives you that feeling both of this celebration and power, but also that feeling of pain and heartache. And the relationship I'm trying to comment on with the quotes is one of dehumanization and the ways in which as Black women in America, we've been treated as less than human. And motherhood is one of the places where you can see it so apparently. We're the only ones in the United States who have been deemed by the law, the givers of non-life through our children, the givers of property. We were told that our children were property that they were not human beings, that they could be taken away from us and that us, their mothers could be taken away from them. And so this book is to challenge that dehumanization, to meet it in the face, to say, this is the truth of the treatment of black women in America, but also to acknowledge the ways in which we've created life despite how it's been taken away from us, despite being told we were less than human, despite being told that we were the creators of property, we have said we will create life and we will do so in so many ways. That's through our activism, through our art, through our creativity, through our writing. Alberta Burtis and Louise showed all of these things even before they became literal biological mothers. And so I also celebrate that, the giving of life through our children and how we ask our children to join us in this battle for those, for others to see us as the human beings that we are with the worth that we deserve with the dignity and with the, the respect that we deserve. And so the book, each chapter will start with those kinds of quotes where one celebrates life and creativity and giving. And the other is one where you can see very clearly what black women of their time were coming up against. Yes. Well, that brings me to the next uh, question, which probably is one of your most asked questions is, with those challenges of mothers across centuries who have gone through what you explained to us a few minutes ago, um, why did you choose these three? Why are the, these uh, sons your focus? And um, what drove you in your choice of that? Definitely, and it's such a good question, you know, because there's so many stories out there of ours that have been erased, forgotten, and many, many more that I hope to tell throughout my career. Um, this is only my debut, so there's more to come. But I started my PhD knowing that I wanted to join other scholars who were correcting the erasure of Black women's lives. I was extremely inspired by Margot Lee Shetterly's Hidden Figures, and of course the film that later you know, made it even more famous, the stories of these three women. And I said, I just want to join her. I want to find other hidden figures. But I also knew that I had a limit. I only had three years in my PhD. I'd already done my master's, so it was going to be kind of a faster program. Um, and that's when I had the idea to start with famous men and this notion of how the spotlight on men and this male gaze is erasing women in so many ways. And when we talk about the civil rights movement, this is another space where erasure is very apparent to me. We often talk about it from the lens of our male figures. And there's been more conversations recently where we say there were so many women, they're contemporaries who were fighting alongside them. Why aren't we telling their stories? Why is it so much easier for us to name male civil rights leaders than it is to, to name female civil rights leaders? Um, and then I thought, okay, and here's a final layer of erasure that I can break down. And that is of motherhood and mother work as Patricia Hill Collins puts it. Those of us who care for others, who nourish others, we have these kind of feminine qualities, not necessarily female qualities, but that have been deemed in society as weak and have been unrecognized and uncelebrated. And I instead want us to change that to say, look at the power of nourishing others, of taking care of others, of giving life to others. I want to think about those roles and I want to show them with the influence that they have. And that's where I came up with the idea of literal motherhood um, and to thought about different civil rights leaders. I had four that I kind of narrowed it down to. James Baldwin, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and Medgar Evers, because they were contemporaries and so often were put in conversation with each other. And even in James Baldwin's writing, that was later adapted into I Am Not Your Negro, the documentary that came out right around the time that I started my PhD. James Baldwin spoke about these men, these other three as his friends, and that he was a witness to their works. And I just loved that. And I decided on Alberta, Burtis, and Louise because they were all born within six years of each other. And their famous sons were all born within five years of each other. 
It just felt like that connection was something I needed to hold on to because I could speak about all of the things that happened in history, each world war, the Great Depression, each president and their policies and how those affected the three women both differently and similarly. And I could bring these intersections together while also celebrating the beautifully rich diversity of their stories. Okay, indeed. You tell you are a storyteller and <laughs> you help us to see into the intimate lives of these women, which is a fascinating uh, phenomenon because they weren't alive to tell you their stories. And so it leads me to the question of how did you then get access and gain access to the elements that you needed for this book and, the, and your burning questions? How did you get access to that? It was incredibly difficult. When any story is kind of purposely erased and maybe sometimes unintentionally, but has been erased because nobody kept track of it or nobody held on to it. You know, even when we think about the pictures of the women, it's very hard to find pictures of them. There's a few more of Alberta King out there, but of Burtis and of Louise, they're almost non-existent because people didn't even think to take photos of them. Um, this kind of erasure made it incredibly difficult for me to find the evidence of their lives. And I write in my author's note, it was like finding a needle in the haystack. And many of the paragraphs that I write, it's almost from five different sources that I've pieced together. And, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize how difficult that was. And it's a compliment to my writing that it came across so smoothly. But I also do, I appreciate the opportunity to speak about the challenge of that. So I started first with the men. There was so much written about the men um, and a lot of things that they'd written themselves or interviews or um, speeches and transcripts that I could go through and take any mention of their moms and kind of start to create my master list. From there, I started to think about the places where there were big gaps and different things that I just had no idea about. So ranging from this kind of estimation of when the women were born up until they had the famous son, there was very little written. I then expanded my search to think about the writings of their family members. So with Martin Luther King Jr., his sister has written a lot about their family and of course mentions his mother a lot. Malcolm X's older brother, Wilfred Little, had done several speeches where he almost always started by speaking about his mother, which was wonderful. Um, and then in Bertus Baldwin's case, her grandchildren especially find it very important to keep their grandmother's name alive. So I went to those. Then from there, I started reaching out to local historians in the different places where the women lived. I was I needed help trying to find birth certificates, death certificates, not only for the three women, but also their family members that could help me track where they lived and where they were. For instance, with Burtis, she doesn't appear on any census data. Um, she's completely erased from that, but her older sister does. And I knew that James Baldwin had said that she was raised by her older sister. So based off of tracking her older sister, I could track Burtis as well. By speaking to a local historian in Deal Island, I could ask where might she have gone to school because she was clearly well-educated. Everybody who knew her said she was brilliant. She wrote these letters that were just beautiful, um, but I didn't know where she'd gone to school. And he said there was only one option. There was only one school for black people at the time. So this is where she had to have gone. So that's how I started to fill in <laughs> those blanks. It took a lot of investigation. And then finally, once I felt very well informed, I approached the family to let them know I was completing this project. I didn't want it to come as a surprise to them. I wanted to respect them as much as possible and also approach them once I'd done my due diligence. These families have been interrogated their whole lives because of their association to the men. And I, I understand how hard that can be. And I didn't want to be somebody who was just throwing more on their plate without being well prepared. And Luckily, a few of them were very willing to at least have a conversation with me over the phone, some in person, and fill in more of the gaps and just tell me from their personal experiences what the essence of each woman was, what, what they loved to do, or what they remembered of each of them. Um, so again, with Burtis, it was love. Everyone kept saying she was just so full of love and light and love that came up with everybody. And with Alberta, it was this constant faith and knowing that there was a plan for her life and a plan for her children's life. And even though she worried about them, that she kept faith at the forefront of her mind. And with Louise, that it was bravery, this courageousness that is almost unbelievable, especially when you get to know her story a little better uh, through the book. 
what she's able to just face and continue to keep her head up high, um, saying that she's going to face that fear and move forward. Thank you for letting us in on your process. I am already fatigued trying to follow it. <laughs> it was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly an investment uh, that you have brought to us in the form of this book that I'm sure you have probably about 10 more books in there to get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like you know, it's, it's so funny. I mean, of course it was a lot of hard work, but when I think for instance about Isabel Wilkerson's The Warmth of Other Suns, something, another book that's incredibly inspiring to me, I think she spent about 10 or 15 years compiling her research. So it's what it takes. You know, there's even, I guess, more I probably could have done had I had more years in my PhD. And so for me, it's it's a, an accomplishment what I've done thus far, but I also hope that it inspires more work about these three women. I don't think this is the end. I don't think we've found everything that's out there. This is instead an invitation to say, let's explore them as the important figures in history that they are. Right. Well, um, speaking about this, timeline of history. When we look at the American Revolution, the Haitian Re Revolution, the French Revolution, we know that there are cycles of these revolutions and these movements. When yeah. you talk about these men, the mothers of these men who have shaped a nation, and we think about them being shaped, the mothers themselves by time, giving birth to sons who would then be fashioned to speak very loudly to us in time. Yeah. What would be your comments to kind of help us understand how you've, uh, or, or what you've revealed, what was revealed to you about this notion of time and what happens as uh, movements uh, go through decades and decades of history? It's a celebration of that as well, this passing of knowledge through generations. So the first chapter about the women, it's even to say their lives don't start all out of nowhere, just, you know, in the middle, <laughs> um, yes. popping out into the air. Um, it's something that we talk about with MLK Jr., Malcolm X, and James Baldwin. So often it's as if they popped out of nowhere, fully formed. Um, and so I also didn't want to reproduce that notion with the women either. Instead, I wanted to ground them in the history of their communities, where they were born, um, thinking about Atlanta's history and how that is going to inform Alberta and thinking about Grenada and the Caribs and the Arawaks and how responding to white colonization is something that Louise carries in her blood. And she knows this from her grandparents as well as the Caribs who teach her who she encounters on her island. And thinking again about Burtis Baldwin and Deal Island, Maryland, and how they're gonna hear stories about the Moses of their people, Harriet Tubman, who travels and does this incredible journey where she liberates hundreds of people, um, right, you know, pretty close to Deal Island, Maryland. So all of that is gonna inform their experiences. They're going to carry this with them into their teenage years, into their marriages, into raising their own children. So to give just some more kind of tangible examples with Louise Little, her grandparents were extremely important to her upbringing and they were liberated slaves. They knew what it was like to be enslaved, to have your freedom taken away from you. And they also carried the importance of maintaining that no matter what. They believed in Black independence and Black pride. And she leaves Grenada to join Marcus Garvey and this Pan-Africanist movement for in an international Black freedom and Black independence. Um, if you're a fan of Malcolm X, a lot of that should sound really familiar anti-assimilation to white culture, celebrate who you are as a black person. Let's think about self-sustaining black communities. This was what Marcus Garvey preached. It's what Louise Little believed in, what Earl Little believed in, and what they later raised their children to believe in as well. And there's specific examples from the other two women, uh, but I don't wanna give too much away from the book. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, stay tuned. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so uh, what, that brings forward uh, another question about, as you begin the book, you talk about your, your being pregnant. You yeah. speak to that. And, and I think about this book as being very pregnant with information mm -hmm. for us. Um, and the celebratory moment of knowing that you were going to be a mother. Yeah. I'm a mother of three. And I know that there are, uh, thousands of mothers out there who appreciate 
your comments about pre preparing your children. Mm -hmm. And it made me think about as things unfold into the future, um, your son may become 16 and he's able to read this probably before that, but <laughs> able to digest what his mother has written in mm -hmm. this book. What would you like him to take away and get from it? Oh, I'm so curious about how my love of motherhood and my view of motherhood being so powerful and strong and influential and the need to recognize mothers is going to influence my son. I wonder if he's going to really fully embrace that or if instead he's going to be like, yeah, 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 I've never read the book. Who knows? <laughs> so we'll see how that plays out. But I do hope that he sees me as the human being that I am. And it was important for me in this book that we see Alberta, Burtis and Louise as whole human beings with feelings who had these children and who lost them and that we acknowledge how difficult that was. And we think about uh, Malcolm and Martin and we think about James also as the human beings who they were. We often erase their humanity when we solely speak about them as kind of literary figures in history. And we almost flippantly remember yes, Malcolm X was assassinated on this day. And it doesn't even inspire the kind of like pain that it should. Um, and so this book is all about recognizing humanity. And I think for a lot of moms, we feel, and especially black mothers, we feel that we're not fully seen in that lack of recognition and that lack of anybody giving us credit for our influence on our children's lives, especially on our sons, because so often there's this notion that men influence their sons more, which is completely crazy. Parents influence their children. That's just what I want us to understand. Um, but many mothers feel unseen. And that feeling day in and day out is extremely painful. And we don't, many of us see our role in the same way that I do, which is like I said, with power, with influence, with strength. And so I hope that my son knows me to be somebody who is important and influential in his life, that he not erase me when he speaks about the influences on his life and what inspired him, um, but that he also sees me as, as someone who's vulnerable and who also deserves the same kind of care and protection and love that I've shown to him. I think it's this kind of mutual relationship that I hope we can establish, but He's very young. He's 16 months old. So I don't want to put too much pressure on his shoulders. And we'll see. I'm a new mom. There's a lot that I'm going to learn in the journey. And I have another one on the way coming in August. So very excited also to learn about different personalities of children. And we adjust as we learn more about each other. Okay. Well, that um, is probably an echo that we can all use with our children hoping that they will remember will see us and insert their success uh, attributable to what we've helped to nurture in them mm -hmm. and, and with that i would like to ask you what are um uh, the what are quotes from your book or feelings from your book about these three women each of them that would be salient and important to you to reveal who they were and their understanding of family. Mm, yeah. Do you want me to read them directly? You, you don't have to, but if you can, that'd be beautiful. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. We had chosen some out, but I decided that I was going to just focus on one passage that spoke about them together because there's a lot of flipping through the pages and I didn't want it to get too distracting, but I'll read this. Alberta, Burtis, and Louise teach us the importance of passing our unique gifts on to others. They all practiced some way of sharing their stories that allowed this book to be possible. Louise practiced the tradition of oral history, sharing her truth with her children and grandchildren. Burtis left her mark through her letters that traveled across the country and the world following her descendants. Alberta made an imprint through fostering other people's talents, and her two T's would remember her any time they sang or played their instruments. All three women lived far beyond their time on this earth. With this in mind, we must do a better job of recording our stories and sharing our truths, not only with our immediate networks, but with as many people as possible. 
It is only a disservice when we hide ourselves, when our children do not know what we have gone through and how we survived it, when we allow others to define who we are. Written records of our contributions are crucial for sustained community strength and shared knowledge. The stories of Alberta, Burtis, and Louise can bring us new breath. By learning the lessons they offered us, even long before they became literal mothers, we can continue to find meaning in our own struggles and accomplishments. Wow. Thank you for that. Thank uh, you for the invitation. To say that that is extremely rich uh, in its offerings and gives us much to think about and ponder. Uh, so many sentences could be a book. Uh, from from what you have just shared with us. Thank you. Um, and with that, I want to uh, draw out, if you will, uh, there is a chapter called Losing Our Sons. Mm -hmm. And um, if I might uh, here bring to the attention of the audience um, that you, you, you quote Mamie Till, I didn't see right away, but there was an important mission for me to shape so many other young minds as a teacher, a messenger, an active church member. God told me I took away one child, but I will give you thousands. He has, and I have been grateful for that lesson. Name me till Mobley. And then in essence, the Negro community has, has been forced into a matriarchal structure, which because it is out of line with the rest of the American society, seriously retards the progress of the group as a whole and imposes a crushing burden on the Negro male and in consequence on a many Negro women as well. Daniel Patrick Moynihan. As a mother of two boys, uh, that struck me as mothers who are always in the caution area of maybe I won't hear from him again. Mm. Maybe I won't hear his voice again. And mm. what he wrote really resonated. Can you comment on that? And this generational trauma that you talk about and this generational privilege and all of that that happens. Yeah, it's an absolute tragedy that in so many ways Alberta, Burtis, and Louise could relate to Mamie Till and what she experienced in terms of losing her child far too early to violence, to white hatred, to racism. And so many Black mothers still experience that now. And it relates back to the first quote, George Floyd, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. There is so much that has been said about this and what I think my book offers is a path forward. I am tired of this being seen as some kind of inevitable pain that black mothers are forced to carry, that we have to worry in this way because our country doesn't see us or our children as the human beings who we are. And my final chapter, my conclusion, I often say is my black feminist manifesto of what we need to do now don't only celebrate Alberta, Burtis, Louise, and Mamie because of what they were able to endure. Don't just sit here in awe saying, wow, that's incredible. It's as if Black women can tolerate more pain somehow than other people can. But instead say, how do we fix the issues that are still in place that are creating circumstances that allow our children to die more often than others? And quite often at the hands of others in these painful, traumatic, violent ways. And I think about reevaluating our criminal injustice system. It is not a criminal justice system as it stands today. I think about reevaluating gun laws that would have not only avoided Malcolm X's death and Martin Luther King Jr.'s death, but Alberta King's death as well. She was assassinated in her, in her church. She was shot in the back. We think about the need for our basic needs to be met, met for a universal income where we can live with dignity and not have to work all of these jobs where we're not allowed to be with our children because we're simply trying to make enough to feed them. When we're thinking about the need for universal preschool and quality childcare so that everybody has an opportunity to start on the same foot and mothers can go back to school if they want to or 
maybe get a job or just breathe for a second and relax and feel a little bit of relief. Um, so the last chapter is all about taking from this admiration that a lot of people seem to have for the pain that Black women endure, this kind of strange voyeuristic obsession with us losing our children, and instead think about how we change the world as we know it, because that is what Alberta, Burtis, and Louise would have wanted us to do. They were change makers. They believed that they deserved dignity and respect that their children did, and they instructed them on ways to achieve that, tactics to achieve that, that their sons carried with them and used to transform the world. But there is so much left to do and so much work left to do, but it's tangible. It's not something that we, again, to just sit here and accept. So I want this book to inspire change. I am not going to sit here and accept that it's okay that I also fear that my child goes out into the world without me and may not return. That's not okay. And I want everybody to realize how unacceptable that is. Okay. Well, my, you certainly, with that kind of writing, that kind of might and manifesto, join the ranks of these three women in uh, manifesting the strength and the quote unquote that that picture of this the black super woman. Um, and though you talk about making it easier for uh, that mother to exist. There is still this mountain we climb as we go. I want to now honor uh, the, the questions from the audiences. audience. If yeah, I, I see a lot coming in. There's a whole lot coming in. <laughs> and one of them says, loved your book. Why do you think the role of the teenage Malcolm in the breakup of his family was never, has never been addressed before, even by him? Interestingly enough, Malcolm did address it. So it's actually more of a question of why scholars and historians left that part of the story out. He was very clear, he says, and I quote him in the book a little bit where he says, you know, the separation from my mom, this is when our family started to disintegrate. And although he's, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, he says, although I was struggling, of course, with the death of my father, the murder of my father, and I was lashing out. I loved my mother and I wanted to stay with her. And later on, um, when he is in prison and then later in a reformatory program where he has access to books and is kind of redefining himself after living as Detroit Red for several years, he writes to his brother as he's getting introduced to the Nation of Islam and he says, mom is the one who introduced us to this first. And he sees it more as a homecoming. He finds familiarity in the teachings of Elijah Muhammad, that these aren't brand new to him, but instead a way that he can carry his parents' legacy forward. Uh, and he talks to Alex Haley about this, actually. I think it's towards the end of the autobiography or maybe even in the epilogue. I don't even think it's in the actual body of the book where he talks about seeing Louise again after she's finally been released from the institution after 25 years of her life and saying she's healthy, she's strong, she remembers more than those who were instrumental in putting her there in the first place. Um, and he talks about how he blocked her out of his mind because it was so painful for him to think about his mother being in many ways imprisoned. This is how they all viewed her institutionalization. Um, and I think it's crucial to his story. If you don't understand that he's been separated from his mother, if you don't understand that the first few years of his life, she is forming his mind and she greets him every time he comes home from school and reteaches him whatever his white teachers have taught him so that he remembers his worth and his value, no matter what other people are going to tell him. And then he's separated from that. that. That's not a coincidence that he then turns to a life of crime. He's mourning the fact that both his parents have violently been taken away from him. Um, and when he finds something that reminds him of them, he latches onto that and takes what he sees in their leadership and transforms yet more minds through this, this doctrine. And then again, thinking about his reuniting with his mom and the last year of his life, he only has a year after she's released before he himself is assassinated. But many transformations happened in his life during this last year. And one of the major ones that he spoke about, but others have not continued to speak about, was this reuniting with his mother. And 
I'll end that part by saying, you know, I know what it's like to have a partner who's um, a public figure. My husband was the mayor of Stockton for four years, is very well known. Um, And even when he gives credit to his mom, his aunt, his grandma, to me and his journey, and we do these interviews all the time where people want to watch us or follow us or ask us questions, and then you go and finally read the article, we are all the time erased, all of a sudden None of our answers are there anymore or anything Michael said about me or his moms are are gone. So it's something that we also have to think about as a society. What are we valuing that even if somebody says this is a part of my journey that we say, oh, that must not really be that big a deal. That doesn't really fit what we think has inspired you. So therefore, we're not going to repeat that. Okay, thank you. There is another question that came from Maria Lattimore. Uh, What similarities are there in relationships between these mothers and their sons? And how do you think these women uh, stimulated their sons? And with that, there is another question that Anthony asked. Um, As you did your research, did you come across any maternal qualities of James, Malcolm, and Martin that you feel they received directly from their mothers? what are some of those qualities? So I see those two questions as being somewhat related. Definitely. You know, the book really, I do try to focus more on their differences because so often we as black women are put into these categories and boxes as if we can be reduced into, um, I don't know, just ways of defining us that I find to be very confining. And so I really did want to focus on celebrating their differences, but of course there are some similarities. Each mom and their approach to raising their children wanted to remind their children of their place in this world being one that was not necessarily intended to be that way. So in the United States, they were going to be seen differently and they needed to be aware of that, but they also never needed to allow that to enter their hearts that they saw themselves in the same way that their nation did, that they could instead still see themselves as the whole human beings that they were. And they needed others, they needed to help others change their perspective so that that was something that we all believed, that we believed in everybody's humanity. They did that really differently, though. Louise was, like I said, extremely brave. She's this radical activist. She faces and confronts her fears and wants to stand up no matter what. She knows her children are witnessing her. So even if it means risking her own life, she's going to do that. She's going to stand tall. So the autobiography of Malcolm X starts with this scene of her pregnant with him and this group called the Black Legion, which is basically very similar to the KKK, has come to her home and they're looking for her husband. They're trying to intimidate her. And she steps out bravely and says, he's not here, um, knowing fully well that they could have hurt her in that moment. But she would rather her children see that she stood up against fear, um, even if she's risking her life and theirs. You know, some would have been like, that's not what you need to do, mom. Like, (laughs) take care of yourself, take care of your kids. But she said, I'm not going to cower in front of my oppressor. And that's what I want my children to know. This is how much I believe in my worth and I believe in theirs. Burtis Baldwin, on the other hand, is somebody who just wraps her children in love. She wouldn't necessarily have called herself an activist, even if I considered her to be one through the amazing love that she showed her children. But she wanted to focus on giving her kids that that love and belief in them with as much as she could control. And all she could control was her relationship with them. But she constantly says, I hope that you'll kind of spread this love to those outside of here because love and light is what matters most. We need to let go of hatred. We need to let go of pain. So she's much more, let's just embrace love and light. Um, And that's how we find our strength. And then with Alberta King, entirely relating it to her faith that Faith could not be faith about social justice, that in interpreting the Bible, it's all about standing up for the oppressed, standing up for the poor, that even if you're privileged, even if you have education, even if you have money, you use this to help others because we all should be equal as we are in the eyes of God. And this is her faith. So they do it very differently, but again, kind of similar themes. And in terms of the second question about these direct relationships to the son's work, That's really what the book is entirely filled with. And it's something that kind of surprised me in my own research. I knew that they were going to be interesting to study, you know, point blank, whether there were direct connections to the son's works. But what shocked me was how 
obvious the connections were to what their sons were able to accomplish. And I'll go through it really fast, just a few examples. Alberta King, her parents are the ones who make Ebenezer Baptist what it still is today. It's not her husband's church, it's her church. And then he inherits it by marrying her. So even the fact that MLK Jr. becomes a reverend is because of his mother and his maternal history. Again, Louise Little, I've already talked about her activism and that connection, I think I've made um, pretty obvious. And Bertus Baldwin being this trained and brilliant writer. Um, the principals at James Baldwin School would say they could tell that he inherited his writing from her simply based off of the letters she wrote to excuse any of his absences. This is how brilliant of a writer she was and how she used every opportunity with her words to help people feel love and feel light and feel inspired. Um, again, he becomes a writer and kind of carries both of their dreams forward. Wow. Well, to wrap up this session, I do want to uh, offer a question from Lois Brown. And she says, this is a powerful book. Do you have any plans to do a companion volume, maybe about influential African-American daughters and their mothers or fathers? Yeah, I love that question. I am actually working on right now a picture book, a children's book about the mothers of influential contemporary Black female leaders. I won't say who yet, but I'm very excited about it. Um, and I think that there will be more conversations. I think maybe it could be through TV or through film, but all about celebrating Black motherhood and the mothers of influential um, Black people, both in our history as well as contemporarily. So there's a lot more to come. Um, and I really appreciate that question. And it makes me feel like I've really arrived as a writer because people are excited <laughs> about what's next. So thank you for that belief in my work. Wonderful. And um, I would like to see if you have another two minute segment that you would like to read um, to us from your book as we close out this session, so. Sure. Black motherhood in and of itself is liberating and empowering. It is the lack of support we need that can make the experience oppressive and draining. Being a black mother should not be seen as a journey one embarks on and endures on her own. Friends and partners when they are present should share in carrying the load black mothers hold on their shoulders. Rather than standing in awe of Black mothers and simply commenting with deference on their incredible strength, others should stand with them and lighten their burden. Partners should participate equally in the home and in supporting Black mothers with their own dreams. Public officials should listen to what Black mothers say they and their community members need. It is time for the honor many quietly pay to Black mothers to become as loud as Alberta's choir, as consistent as Bertus's love, and as strong as Louise's fight. We want to thank you. Thank you, Marishi. Thank you so much. <laughs> we want to thank you for this volume, this exciting evening that you have provided your comments from the three mothers how the mothers of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and James Baldwin shaped a nation. This is a fine volume and it is a must have. So I am so privileged myself and uh, the, our audience to have had you tonight to share your thoughts. And we hope we can have another conversation at another time with yeah. you and your brilliance and your genius. Thank, Thank you so much for the thoughtful questions and the time. Oh yeah, uh, it was definitely my pleasure. And I just want to say on behalf of our audience that we honor the questions that you posed in uh, our chat. And we hope at some point we can get to ask them, some of them again and again and again and again with Anna. So uh, uh, your, your questions are not taken in any way for granted. Thank you so much for participating. So, Anna, please keep writing. Thank you. <laughs> I will. Okay. And so we would like to now um, share some of the collaboration and the upcoming uh, events for the Museum of African American History. We want to invite you to check us out at www.mah.org. Uh, we have, as the Museum of 
African American history, upcoming race in the public dialogue, topics that will be discussed. The next event we have is uh, uh, courtesy of the Boston Globe, Black History Month Film Festival, and the film Glory, a discussion on that Thursday, February 25th from three o'clock to 3.30 p.m. Please join us when you can, but this time I'm sure it will be a treat as many of us have experienced that movie and have questions. We also have an upcoming conversation, next slide please, with Repairing America One Drop with author Yabe Blay, moderated by Ibrahim X. Kendi. This is certainly going to be an exciting moment as we look at the shift, shifting the lens on race, March the 1st, 7.30 p.m. Join us and please keep attuned to our programs. We will have at the, uh, the Glory discussion, the presentation uh, and question and discussion by our CEO president, Leon Wilson. And I'm sure he has some points that he wants to share with the filmmaker at Zurich. So these upcoming programs, we invite you to join us. So thank you, Anna, and thank you, Lamurchi. Uh, one of the things that I really love about these events is that even when you think you know a lot about a, a topic or a subject, you read a new book and you discover that you really don't know much at all. And that was, for me, certainly true in, in this particular case. So I hope you will all, all of you, feel welcome to visit us in the Massachusetts State House after we reopen. In the meantime, I'd like to invite all of our viewers today to start by looking at our website to learn about our resources, our services, and our really great collections. You can type in a simple version of our URL, mass.gov lib, and that will take you right to our homepage where you can go in all sorts of directions. You'll see on this slide showing right now that our holdings cover a wide variety of formats and topics, though most of our holdings do document Massachusetts history and government. So you're welcome to contact us for help with your research questions and we'll do the best we can while working remotely. And of course, we'll be glad to provide in-person help once the State House and the State Library reopen. So our next two events, um, both in collaboration with others, uh, will happen in March and April. The first and on March 25th, we will feature Carla Gardina Pestana. She's a renowned historian from UCLA and the author of The World of Plymouth Plantation. And she'll be in conversation with Richard Pickering of Plymouth Patuxent Museums. And then on April 23rd, we will collaborate again with uh, American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society and the Boston Public Library on a talk by Toby Pearl on her new book, Terror to the Wicked, America's first trial by jury that ended a war and helped to form a nation. So this book is about uh, what many of us know as the Pequot War, but it's presented from a whole new perspective. So I hope you'll be able to join us for both of those things. So thank you, I'm Margaret. Beth, thank you so much. Um, we at American Ancestors New England Historic Genealogical Society are delighted to have been co-presenters tonight. Um, this is such an important history of women and black history. Uh, and just a quick reminder, if you're doing family history research, you're working on your own family's history or you're doing a biography of other important women as Anna did, um, we might be able to help you. Although our stacks on Newbury Street are currently closed because of the pandemic, our virtual doors are open. Our digital archives are full of facts. We have 1.4 billion names uh, to be precise. We're the team behind the GU 272 Memory Project. 
which tells the stories of the enslaved people sold by the Jesuits of Georgetown University in 1838. On the website gu272.americanancestors.org, you'll find family histories, a searchable database with tens of thousands of names and oral histories with living descendants. We offer research advice and many programs. Uh, two days from now, our focus is on Black families in revolutionary era Plymouth, Massachusetts. And tomorrow on our Facebook page, you can see um, a news report, one of our genealogists talking about overcoming the challenges to doing African-American family history research. Uh, we are also the team uh, behind producing Henry Louis Gates's junior show, uh, Finding Your Roots. So we are all about families. We're all about all families. So I do encourage you to chat with our genealogists or visit the website, AmericanAncestors.org to learn more about that. And back to the world of books um, and back to virtual talks, um, driven by our love of American stories, all American stories, we're offering these free events virtually in the American Inspiration Series again. On March 2, we're welcoming historian Russell Shorto, the author of Revolution Song and the Island of the Center of the World about Dutch New York. He'll discuss his new memoir, Small Time, a story of my family and the mob, which takes us back to his hometown in rural Pennsylvania uh, and to the old country of Sicily, Italy. Uh, he'll be in conversation with Alexander Stila of Columbia's Journalism School. And on March 23, we're presenting two Pulitzer Prize winning authors. John Madison will share his latest book, A Worse Place Than Hell, How the Civil War Battle of Fredericksburg Changed a Nation. He'll be talking to historian Deadly Applegate, who was awarded the Pulitzer for her biography on, her on Henry Ward Beecher. Um, Beth of the State Library has already mentioned our April 13 event about the Pequot War and America's first trial by jury. A registration for all these events are now open and accessible through AmericanAncestors.org, our website. Even in a pandemic, our mission is to educate, inspire, and connect. And we're working hard to do that with these partners on screen. We hope you'll join us again. And Kristen, back to you. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you very much, Anna and Lamerchi. Thank you, Beth. And I'd also like to thank our behind the scenes team as well. Um, some of the upcoming talks at the Boston Public Library you can see here. You can find out more about these as well as other programs for all ages at bpl.org. And again, if you're interested in buying your own copy of The Three Mothers, please support our local partner Frugal Bookstore and they can ship the book nationwide. The link is in the chat and it's on the screen there. Thank you to Anna Malika Tubbs, Lamurchi Frazier, our partners, our behind the scenes team, and thank you all for joining us this evening and we do hope to see you soon. Thank you, good night.